My name's Mark Tipple and I don't really know what I do. I make short films and shoot photos, basically relating around the ocean and stuff that interests me. Sometimes I get paid for it. <laughs> I was basically shooting surfing when I was you know, in high school, making surfing films and travelling around Australia, just trying to chase the, the biggest and the best waves so that I could film people doing it. Um, and then it was basically at the time when digital video cameras started coming out. So I went from the tape cameras and then digital cameras came out like the little Sony PC9s and stuff. Um, and then the IMAX started coming out with all iMovie inbuilt and stuff. So I was just before that, like I was still shooting on the Hi8 cameras and just this little punk kid just like shooting all this surfing and then transferring it to digital. Um, and it sort of seemed like the market exploded like about six months after I had released like my first film. Um, so I sort of gave it a miss and went to still photography because, you know, magazines still needed, needed the photos and that sort of, um, that interest. And then tried to incorporate like the ocean into the photography, so started doing underwater stuff. Um, and yeah, then went to film school and tried to tie everything together with the photos and the ocean and the video and the storytelling and it sort of all just like exhumed into what I'm doing now. It's taken about 10 years, I guess. So what are you doing now? Sitting on the ground talking to you. <laughs> um, now I basically make short films, the like two to three minute advertorials for um, businesses and clients, organisations, and it's all based around you know, the story, like um, branded products basically, or branded stories, so that they can use it to show the fundraising side of what they do or promotional side of what they do. Um, I work with a lot of humanitarian organisations and the charity business model and, and people who are helping others basically. Um, yeah, it's good fun. I made a film about a year ago now which was called Duct Tape Surfing. It's about a 50-year-old paraplegic woman who wanted to go surfing. Obviously can't use her legs, so they were drunk one night and one of her son's friends said, just jump on my back. And they, they practiced while they were drunk and she was holding onto his neck and stuff and he could stand up as you do when you're surfing. But she was moving around a little bit, so there was a, a roll of duct tape sitting next to them. So um, taped her to him and went surfing. And it was such a cool story. They're actually really good friends of my good friends back home, like a super remote town in South Australia. And um, there's amazing waves around. So I was like, let's, let's make a film. So yeah, it went pretty well online. Um, got heaps of, like we basically had a, a crowdfunding platform based around it so that they could do this six month road trip. Um, and yeah, basically the, the response from that sort of funded the, the road trip and led to more duct tape surfing trips. <laughs> I guess like, because I've, I've always been doing this personal series about people who are doing cool stuff with the ocean. You know, the ocean just fascinates me. So I was like tagging along with my friends who were going surfing or I met a guy who does yoga on the beach every morning so that he can gain energy from the sunrise and the oceans. Like it's really, it's a pretty spiritual place. I don't, I don't see it as that, it just interests me. But I've been doing this series for probably two years, like just sporadically. Um, and then one of my main clients is a disability organisation. So always working with people who are either physically or mentally handicapped. And then this story, I just heard about my friend of friends surfing and it was like disability plus the ocean, plus they're doing something cool. So I was like, put it all together in a film. And because I had all that back, like almost catalog of stuff, which is similar to what they're doing, um, and you know, the way the web works, everything's all connected and links going back and forth. So it definitely promoted the stuff that no one had really seen before, um, like the personal series, which I'm, you know, I'd rather do a lot more personal work than actual commissioned work. And to have that sort of flow on and to see the licensing options that came through the duct tape surfing, which you know, promotes um, brands or products. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a convergence of all of this sort of work and different marketing outlets that I'd been looking into myself and it all came together in one short film. Stock photography or video has always been, oh, that's stock. It's very, 
bland, safe. Um, it's almost got that like, stock gloss around it. So you see a photo on a website and it's like, oh, it's stock. Whereas now, because of the last you know, 10, 15 years of stock being in you know, the creative space, a lot of agencies are moving towards user-generated content. So they're looking at Vimeo, they're looking at YouTube, they're trying to find the cool stuff that they can then use in their um, commercials or on websites or something, which is real. Yeah, it's, it's the shaky camera, it's the, the sun flares coming through the lens as a, a chick's like brushing her hair or something. It's just the real moments. And then they can have a, a 30 second spot with a, a Corona logo or something at the bottom and it just puts you in that place and makes you, makes you feel like you're warm with the sun billowing through the window or whatever it may be. So the user generated content is just going crazy at the moment. And there's a lot of agencies who are now trying to source out filmmakers who are doing this stuff like off their own back. And I was just talking to an agency this morning, they're basically partnering with Vimeo to have this direct link so you can click like when you upload a film you click and say this can be used for commercial purposes of course it's at your discretion you say no I don't want to do that or you know they always have to go through you it's not like it's it's once you upload it it's gone um, but you know commercial rates for video can go between you know, low budgets between like a thousand to fifteen hundred per second up to I mean it, it's I've heard it can go, well, it can go to two and a half grand a second. It'd have to be pretty, pretty good to reach above that. But you know, some of the shark footage that friends of my brother has goes for 5,000 a second. Yeah, and that's just sitting on your hard drive. Could be from a project that you worked on three years ago. But if it's good enough, then it's a pretty, pretty amazing way to finance another trip to shoot more cool stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's basically, it just comes back to you to do stuff, you know, put it online, get it out there. You know, it's pretty easy to get stuff out there through social media or through YouTube, Vimeo. The Vimeo staff picks are the first place that people look at. And then GoPro does it all the time. They see the, the hashtag show up online and they'll see it and go, we can use that. Yeah, that's just for them. Their internal use, they use duct tape surfing. Um, they contacted and said, hey, can we use this? I was like, yeah, sure, what are your terms? And it was all pretty good. So, yeah, they, they, need the, they need the spam to show, hey, this was shot on our cameras. You should buy our cameras so you can shoot stuff like this. So, it's a pretty exciting time. I used to care about picture. Now I don't. <laughs> I went through the, like, lighting and all the, like, dolly shots and all very planned. But I found that the story suffered. Like I basically do everything by myself, so I'm super stubborn and if someone asks their help, I'll probably say yes, but I'll normally just go ahead and do it, uh, which, which, you know, you, you've got too many hats on, you're trying to get the story out of the people or you're trying to, trying to make sure it's all coherent and then you're focusing on the lighting or the, the camera movements and the two just don't gel. So at the moment, you know, the stage that I'm at it in my career, for want of a better word, I'd rather have you know, handheld camera and run after someone, then have it all nice and smooth and, you know, basically c concentrate on the story. So if the story is about someone running and they're not giving it their all because they're worrying about the dolly shot if they're not running fast enough so that the camera can keep up with them or something like that, I'd rather just say, go for it, show me the, show me the exertion that you need to get, you know, to get better, to get fitter, to progress in your chosen field than what the camera's doing. So it's, it's all about story for me now. If there's a couple of bumps in the camera, I'm good with that. <laughs> it's very, I'm flying the wall. So I went through the 5D stage of, you know, just, just the camera, um, you know, eyepiece and a fader on the front. So it's really minimal. I can just basically uh, uh, align with an organization or, you know, I used to work with Salvation Army a lot. So we'd be going through some pretty raw places and you know, the, the homeless people on the streets would be like serving them and working with them. So I didn't want to have this big rig or lighting or anything. So it was all pretty down and dirty, but that allowed me the access to be able to actually show what they're doing. Um, moving that into 
you know, less kind of access based um, stories or projects. Um, the DSLR just, you know, it was pretty limited. You know, I think it's only like five steps of, five stops of range or something, or always having blown out skies for want of the, the face to be shown or something. So I got the C100. Um, again, it's pretty small and it's not the top down shots, like, because I'm like 27 foot tall. So having the, the shoulder rig with the cannons and always on the, the eye and stuff, plus all the accessories that you need to get good sound and stuff, I was always shooting down. Whereas with the C100, I can you know shoot from the hip almost. And I was with the duct tape, you know, she was in a wheelchair, so she's obviously a lot lower than me. And there were so many shots that I didn't use just because I'm too tall and I'm looking down at her and that's not the not the feel that I wanted to get through. I wanted people to be like on her level as she's like wheeling up these dirt roads and stuff. So at that stage, I think I just just stopped it down. So I had a lot of depth of field and just shot from the hip. Whereas with the C100 now, I can actually see what I'm shooting and maybe have it in focus a bit more than I did. <laughs> I've got a glide cam. I just did a shoot, a, a short film for a school in South Australia. And actually, it's a small town, there's only two high schools. And I made a film for one of them last year. And then this year, their competition approached me and said, hey, like, we need a film because they've got a film. And I was like, you realise I did that one? They're like, yeah, we know. I said, well, I don't want to make a carbon copy of that one, but wearing different uniforms. So I pitched them a bit of a, a bit more cinematic sort of thing um, and got a glide cam plus a little drone with a GoPro, which actually crashed the first shoot of the first day. Like the first, first shot of the first day, it fell from 50 feet and there's like seven pieces of my drone on the ground. So I was like, all good, not to worry. <laughs> Picked up the glide cam and kept shooting with that. <laughs> but um, yeah, glide cam's good. It's sort of the, the less, um, it's definitely not handheld and it's not steady cam. It's kind of like that in between, the almost floaty cam sort of thing, which is it's kind of how I look when I walk. I'm always sort of like vague, like. <laughs> but yeah, apart from that, like it's most of my stuff's interview based. So there's a sit down interview, and then there's all the visuals on top of it. And the visuals are normally pretty raw, handheld, like to put people in the moment as though they're along the along the ride with the person. Um, but yeah, so there's generally a tripod and a radio mic or a boom mic, depends on the location. Um, and yeah, all works pretty, pretty smoothly. I'm pretty much doing what I want at the moment. It's, you know, having that one-on-one, -on -one, um, I don't deal through a production company, I just deal with clients, which is really cool to have that relationship. I'm not going through an agency who's then dealing with the client and then, you know, feedback gets lost in translation through the agency to me. You know, it could be the approval process for an edit. It takes an extra day to get across, so by the time that feedback gets back, sorry, the feedback comes back to me through the agency, it could be lost in translation or my headspace isn't there. To have that one-on-one, -on -one, um, one -on -one relationships, what it's all about with me. And at this stage, it's, yeah, it's working. I want to do more personal stuff. The last six months has been basically all, you know, commercial-ish sort of stuff. Like, it's it's what I want to do, but it's always for a purpose. It's never just this is something cool that I wanted to make, which is where most of the licensing comes through, because that's when you get really, you know, it's it's not as staged as doing a proper shoot. It's like oh, I'm going to go to somewhere with a mate, and we're going to get all this footage and have fun at the same time and that's what can be licensed at the end. I've got a couple of, well, I need to keep the Ocean series going. It's been about almost a year since the last thing I did. Um, and I mean, that's, that's where my heart lies. You know, cool people doing cool stuff with the ocean. It's such a basic tagline, but you know, I, I just love meeting, because the ocean's the same entity, you know, it's the same thing around the world. It just has different faces and different you know, it's playful in the Pacific, it's like raw as anything in, in southern Australia, Tasmania, it's just crazy. But wherever you go, there's people who use it for a different purpose. Could be fishing for your food, your family's dinner, could be surfing for enjoyment, could be, you know, fishing for 
employment. You know, it's, it just interests me. So finding people who are doing cool stuff is, I'm sort of always on the lookout and trying to buy time, like find time when I'm not working for a client to go and make something interesting. What inspires you? Definitely the ocean, but like the ocean's just so inspiring. It's kind of a, I don't like nature, I like people. So if it was just the ocean, I wouldn't go and shoot it because there's no, there's no one there that I can connect to. So when someone's doing something cool in the ocean, then I'm like, sweet, I can connect with you and see how, see what you do in the ocean. Um, I've got a film that I'm working on, it's been like a year now, with a, a Zen practitioner. And he, he's a free diver at the same time. So he meditates underwater with fish. He'll dive down, it's only about 10 meters deep where he lives, and he'll just clutch onto a rock and just hang out and meditate and interact with fish. <laughs> Such a cool guy. But when I heard about that story, I've known the dude for like 15 years and didn't know that he did this. So I was just like, that's cool. So I'm always keen to, to just like find people who are doing different stuff. I know that licensing's definitely playing a huge part, um, which, you know, there's agencies constantly looking for, for new creative stuff. And, you know, that, that's always online. You know, they're looking at YouTube, looking at Vimeo for, for stuff that could be used in, in a commercial purpose. And if you've got something that, you know, may just be shot on your, um, yeah, maybe not an iPhone, but, you know, shot on a 5D or something, and then that can actually pay for you to, to go and rent an Epic and go shoot something, you know, the same thing but better. Um, yeah, licensing is interesting and there's a lot of information online about it, so just check that out. I'm in a bit of a anti-social media state at the moment. <laughs> a couple of my friends are getting really depressed when they don't get a thousand likes on a photo and I don't want social media to affect me like that. So it, it hasn't before and I've just sort of like stepped away from it. Um, but when I've got something to share that I'm really passionate about, I'll, I'll definitely use it. Um, I saw duct tape got out there. You know, I went through Facebook and basically searched surfing plus disability and all these, these pages and brands came up and a simple generic message, hey, this is what I've done, like, check it out. And it just, you know, started filtering out and just went pretty well. Um, the, the daily stuff I don't think is really that interesting. Like, I work in projects, so it might take me three months to have something that's worth sharing. And in that meantime, I won't really share that much. Um, but when I've got something, I generally hit it pretty hard. And I mean, there's, there's obviously the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, there's also Behance, um, you know, the local things like The Loop, they've all got their social media things. Um, it's definitely a necessary evil, but only when you've got something that is, you know, that you're 110% committed to. If there's stuff in between that's not really, you know, not really doing that well, don't worry about it, because it's, it's just here today, gone a second later. Um, and if that's stopping you from shooting other stuff, then don't worry about it <laughs> at all. You definitely need a website as well. You know, the first thing people are going to do is Google your name. And I'm, I'm so web site, web developing, I don't even know what the development or the site is. I'm just illiterate with all that stuff. Um, the templates that are out there can be pretty cheap, easy to run, easy to maintain. And just making, making yourself have a web presence is like definitely critical these days. It's like going from the you know, I've got an email address to now you need a website. Just to, even just to show your stuff, even if it's just straight through from Vimeo, you know, you have a website and then just link stuff straight through. Um, for what I do, because it's all freelance, I don't work with a production company or agency, it's a necessity for me. And the, the template guys are just like my, my best friends because they make my life easy. And I can't break websites as much as I used to. <laughs> It'd be like offline for two weeks and just be like, ah. Please, no one Google me. <laughs> you just got to do it. I mean, I used to teach at the film school, and you'd see the progression of students who, you know, are graduating, and I'd work with them right towards the end, and we'd be like, oh, so what do you want to do? And they'd tell me. It could be screenwriting or directing or whatever. And you'd see them in six months' time. It's like, hey, how's it all going? And they're like, oh, I haven't got funding. 
And it's like, well, what have you done then? Like, nothing, I haven't got funding. It's like, well, you need to do stuff to get funding. I mean, even if it's shooting on an iPhone, you've just literally got to do stuff. And then at least that'll show what you can do, even with no money, so that when people want you to do stuff, they'll be like, sweet, we'll give you, you know, 100 grand or whatever it may be to go and do what you did before, but with a higher production value. It's, um, and it's so easy to say, I know. But you just got to keep, because people are always wanting new stuff. They're wanting to find new directors. They're wanting to find people who are creative in a different way to, you know, how advertising's done before. And um, if you're not doing it, then how are they going to find you? <laughs>